Hey everybody, it's uh, March week two and the Deep Haven community team here is back with another demo. Started. All right, first up we've got Alex. He's gonna show us uh, some work he's been doing with Deep Haven UI. Take it away, Alex. Yeah, so um, first of all, I am pulling data from a real-time weather API that updates about every 15 minutes. So I'm hoping to make um, something like uh, a cool weather app. Um, I'm using a new feature being prototyped that makes it super easy to ingest JSON data into Deephaven tables. Um, so in the background, I'm producing that JSON data um, to a Kafka stream and ingesting that here um, with, our, with our new stuff. Um, so when I run that, uh, a bunch of tables get created that have all of the data um, that I've asked for for my API. Um, and then I have some dashboard stuff. So right now uh, we have a bug with our tab view that makes the plots not all come out quite right. So I'm, this is a, a temporary hack, um, but here we go. I mean, so this is a very bare bones skeletal version of a weather app. Um, you can see I'm, I'm from Texas. Um, I'm currently in Austin and it is currently overcast and that looks about right. Um, you can sort of see, you know, um, a general uh, weather map, uh, heat map rather, of these, these sort of different uh, features that you may be interested in. Um, all of this is connected to the real-time API. So when new data ticks in, and again, that's roughly every 15 minutes, um, all of these values will update accordingly. Um, I've got this this guy that is looking at air quality and and uh, when when air quality goes bad as it sometimes does this will turn yellow or red accordingly. Um, here I have you can sort of click through these different uh, different statistics and, and check out you know sort of how the week has been trending with respect to these different things. We have some bugs here. Uh, you know this this title is not uh, changing the way it should be, but we're we're working this out. Um, so all of this is is working really smooth um, and we are in the process of figuring out really great defaults um, for making all of this stuff look awesome uh, just right out of the box uh, rather than uh, maybe being uh, left justified without without so much space but uh, in addition to good defaults um, we've we've made it pretty easy to um, figure out how to make these values look great yourself um, uh, you know, sort of provide an additional layer of customization on there. Um, so in addition to that, I have a another sort of work in progress um, historical weather dashboard. So as you can see here, this is very much a work in progress. Um, so with this guy, this guy was all about sort of current weather. And again, you can see sort of some of the some of the finicky stuff uh, that we got going on there. Um, this is very much focused on historical weather um, and We've made it super easy to um, to plot the relevant data in in, uh, in these tables and and you know to see different values that you might be interested in um, over different time spans and you can see it's super fast and super responsive and because this is Plotly Express you can zoom in and zoom out as your heart desires and change whatever you like and it's going to latch on to that time window and that place um, again uh, we have we have the titling bugs that I talked about earlier. Um, but, you know, overall, I mean, this is running a lot smoother than I would expect for a table with, what is it? Almost 100,000 rows, right? Um, part of that is because I'm using Deep Haven's partition tables to do that particular historical work. Um, so that speeds up things quite a bit. Um, but yeah, going forward, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to fill this out and, uh, you know, sort of, style over the skeleton that I've got here, make everything really visually appealing um, and, and clean. And uh, I think it's cool. It, it, it'll be it'll be a good example of an end-to-end -end sort of raw data through the Deep Haven internals, finally to a, a dashboard sort of endpoint um, project. And, you know, when it's done, we'll make the repo public and uh, everyone can, can go take a look at it. So uh, that's the weather dashboard. Can you show some of that uh, dashboard code a little bit there? You kind of glossed yeah, it. Yeah, you bet. Sure. A little bit. You bet. So um, 
right now I have these sep uh, separated into different Python scripts. Um, I'm I'm working on sort of disentangling things in this way for the moment. Um, but the way that I have approached doing this is sort of finding the most atomic elements of the dashboard, I guess, and um, defining them each as UI components, um, sort of doing the smallest moves that I can in, in each of these uh, areas, um, and then sewing it all together at the end with our new dashboard thing. And I found that the benefit with doing this is that once I sort of have all of these pieces in place, it's really easy to come down here and move things around. Earlier, I, I sort of had two columns and decided I want to sort of flip things around and, and make it two rows instead. And it was really easy to do that because I had sort of segmented things up and I didn't have these massive pieces of, of code uh, clutter up the, the layout space, right? Right, and you can reuse oh. those components in another dashboard then too. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I do that, I do that here. Uh, with this historical dashboard, those these these same functions get used. Um, so it's it's really the 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 pattern you know here has made it super easy to zero in on the on the smallest sort of most atomic element of the thing, make sure that it works how you want it, and then you can integrate it into any part of this thing, you know, in, in any way you see fit. And it's super easy to come down here and and rearrange things and. Uh, yeah, it makes for it makes for a really really great experience, and it's easier every day. All right, very cool. All right, next up we have Larry. He's going to show us uh, some sorting performance with indexing. Larry. Take it away. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate just on a, a fairly small data set how data indexing can speed up um, operation performance. So data indexing is a, co a topic we'll you'll hear, be hearing a lot more about um, in the coming weeks. But here's just a demonstration of it. But the idea is that Deep Haven will, will be able to build um, index tables for not just static data, but also um, ticking data. And these index tables can be reused, like any kind of index would be um, for a large data set. So uh, this is a very quick and basic demonstration. I'm going to just bring in a data table off of disk. And this table is a parquet data table with just a few columns, but it does have 60 million rows. And so and it's not a trivially small data set, but I'm going to concentrate on sorting today. And I have a couple of just quick functions that are going to just help me time some of the sorting features I'm going to show. So in this demo, I'm going to produce a sorted table. And I'm going to sort, actually, I missed the first one. I'm going to sort the 60 million row table on this row right here, this column that has um, 1 million unique values. Let's go ahead and kick that off, get a feel for how long it's going to take. This is running on my laptop. Um, not especially powerful, so. And you're, and um, you're really we're video looking right now too, so. And it's video. video. <laughs> so okay, let's see. That took a. Uh, this is in milliseconds, so that took a little over 11 seconds. But we can see our data was pulled off of disk, and is properly sorted. Great. Okay. Um, let's do a multi-column sort. Um, we're going to sort first by 250, and then by this at 640. Um, previous tests, it took like from 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, so that's what we're looking for now. And I just point out this is unindexed data. This was just data that could have been from any source. And we've done, okay, 18 seconds. And then I, I, I wanted to make a note. I, there's a line I ran here, which is don't memorize, memoize the results. So uh, just to show that I'm not cheating and take advantage of a previous result, I'm going to run the exact same data function again, the sort function again. Should take uh, 18 seconds again. 
it should take somewhere on the order, maybe some uh, data caching off of disk benefits, but I would expect that, that would all have been taken care of in the first sort. So yeah, okay, dead on the money. All right, and uh, it, it's not particularly interesting to um, to run this next sort. I'll, I'll run it after we create some data indexes. But this is where things start getting, getting interesting. I can create an index on this particular table over this column. And this index is not going to reorder the table in any way. It'll build um, a non-clustered um, single column index. Let's just go and kick this off because this does take a little bit of time. Oh, and it looks like I've got a probably a naming problem in here. Missing a parenthesis. Oh, thank yeah. you. Got the yeah. All right. Pair programming is great, especially when it's a 20-person pair. <laughs> I think they call that mob programming. OK, so this is building the index. And it is taking some time, because it's it's generating an in-memory um, an in memory table. And I'm actually taking the time to show you what this table looks like. So our, our index is essentially the column and then the row set of the data table that this is the indexing. And these are not in a particular order. That's because we're taking advantage of just hashing and we'll we'll jump to these values very quickly. But this is a one uh, a data and data index of one million rows. And if I was to rerun this sort function, I believe the number to beat is about eleven seconds. And there we go. About a 10 times speed up. On that sort function. Okay, I'm going to create a data index on a multi-column index, and this is a uh, this is pretty new feature for Deep Haven. So creating, and then I'll also display this data index. But you'll see that um, it, the index table have two columns, and then the row sets that relate to those individual values. Okay. So not unexpected. There's 160,000 rows and associated rows and row keys with every um, permutation of that. All right, we've got the data index. Our numbers were beat were 18 seconds. Let's see how this does. 321 milliseconds. Oh. And um, we're also just these. Uh, from our index point of view, ordering is not particularly important. So we can also sort by these two columns that are included in the index out of order, and we'll get extremely efficient and also correct data sort. That looks blazing fast. Yeah. In this case, it's about a probably a 50 times speed up, which is pretty cool. All right. I'm going to attempt to demonstrate this on ticking tables. So I'm going to reuse my data table here as kind of a source, kind of hack it into turning it into a very large ticking table. So once this is up, we'll see the original 60 million rows. And every second, it's going to add another 1,000 rows. But this is a live table. We can demonstrate that right here. Data is coming in. Uh, let's do our. Our test here, uh, it's still between 18 to 20 seconds, I think will be the, the approximate number here. Their sorting is an expensive, uh, expensive operation. On a live table, we actually maintain more state, so we can insert rows properly into the sort. So there's a little more memory overhead, a little more computation overhead, not unexpected. The, comp the comparison is 22 seconds. Let's create. This time, it will be. Uh, the table that will be generated by the index and used internally will be a refreshing table. And when this comes up, it won't be as easy to see that the data index is live. Yeah, because it could be updating rows in the middle of. Well, these, it's actually fixed. The number of rows is fixed because the number of permutations. What's happening is we're extending these row sets as new come as new data comes in. But the time to beat was 22 seconds, and we can run 
I'll just run both at once, just so we'll get both numbers. Okay, first number's in, about a four times speed up. And then second one, so about a three times speed up. All right, so that's just some of the operation. That's just one of the operations that can be accelerated by indexes. Um, uh, the interaction that we'll have is a Parquet file can be written, like these indexes that are held in memory now, can actually be written to disk and leveraged from disk. So if you have a very, very large data set, we'll be able to um, you know, selectively bring in the indexes as needed. OK, that's a quick preview. And like everything else, Steve Haven, it works. That's it for this week. We'll see.